Bruchem Aboim. Tonight's topic is a uh, personality trait that can be a problem, jealousy. And the uh, Webster defines it as an unhappy or angry feeling of wanting to have what someone else has. Jealousy really connects, it's not, it doesn't stand by itself, it connects to coveting and envy. They're all really one in, in the same package, so to speak. Um, Rabbi Lazar Akapar in Pirkei Avot, in the Ethics of the Father, says that envy, lust and honor seeking, drive a, drive a man from the world. So it's not just a, uh, a little thing. The truth is that jealousy can destroy relationships, uh, especially between men and women, marriages and uh, just dating relationships. Jealousy is a complex emotion that encompasses many kinds of feelings ranging from fear of abandonment to rage and humiliation. It can be a problem among siblings competing for parental attention or the envy of a more successful friend. Even in religion, different groups within a religion, in Judaism, even within Orthodox Judaism, Really, it's uh, interesting. I have uh, five siblings. My mother was alive. She rest in peace. Uh, my siblings and I fought all the time. And when my mother died, we stopped fighting. There was nothing to fight about. Because what we fought about was my mother's love. So the truth of the matter is, is that what, that's what many religious different groups do. They all want to be God's favorite and even religions in general, each one trying to be that which God favors the most. And it's a competition of jealousy of sorts. Now when you covet something, you desire a sandwich, for example, when you see me eating it. That would be desire. But if you wanted my sandwich, and another one like it wouldn't satisfy your desire, that's coveting. And we'll get into this because of the commandment, the 10th commandment in the Torah, of not coveting. We'll deal with that a little bit later. Coveting takes, takes desire to the levels of greed, extortion, and even obsession. Overcoming jealousy is like changing any emotional reaction or behavior. It really begins with awareness. Trying to change jealousy once you're into the emotion is like trying to control a car that's skating on ice. One has to attempt to eliminate or at least diminish insecurity and low self-esteem. One cannot accept it as that just who I am. This is one of the problems that we're very tolerant with what we call our personality. And the truth of the matter is that we're all born with a deficiency or deficiencies, which is what makes us human. When you can no longer identify with people having problems, personality traits that aren't all they should be, then the truth of the matter is, like Moshe, Moses died when he could no longer understand the Jews, that the Jews asked for water. He had reached such a level that water wasn't even important. After all, he had been on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights three times, hadn't eaten or drink. So to him, water was unimportant. In order for us to be able to live as human beings, we have to be able to identify with other people's weaknesses, their deficiencies, their personality traits. But we cannot accept our own. Man was not created perfect. In fact, we see that at birth. The first thing that happens to a young Jewish boy, eight days old, is we give him a, what we call a bris mila, circumcision. We take the foreskin off to say that man was not created perfect. And not only that, it's interesting. Many people don't realize it, but according to Orthodox law, you do not anesthetize the baby, which is really very strange. After all, I mean... My brother, I went in for a root canal, and when I finished up, I was kind of laying down, and I looked up, and I said, when are they going to start? And he's laughing at me like I'm an idiot because I was so knocked out, I didn't even know they had done it and didn't even feel it. He said the same thing to me when he had his root canal because they basically knock you out. You don't feel anything, thank God. But yet the baby is not allowed to be anesthetized. Why? And the answer is that from the time a child is eight days old, two things are taught. Number one is you're not perfect, and you need to correct that by human means. 
And secondly, no pain, no gain. If you want to take the easy road, the easy road does not lead to success. The easy road, though it may seem more painless in the end, is much more painful because what you have is failure and trying to get yourself out of that failure becomes very difficult. So to say when someone says, I'm just a jealous person, I can't help myself, it's not acceptable. Of course you can help yourself. You need to identify the fact that that is part of your personality and then work on it. And it doesn't mean knocking down the tree with one blow. It means swinging at it again and again and again and you chop it down little by little. You know, when the evil side of us tries to get us to, to sin, to err, it doesn't get you to rob a bank. It's not that stupid. But what the evil side does is get you to steal a penny. And then he gets you to rob the bank. Breaks you down little by little. And the way that you overcome your evil side, so to speak, is the same way, little by little, but holding on to those gains. And that becomes important. Also, parents should be aware of what we call sibling rivalry and jealousies. They should be careful to treat all the children with equal love and attention. And again, the Torah, the Bible, is not a storybook, not a history book. As a history book, it fails bitterly. What it is and does a very good job at, it's an instruction manual. And that's why we study it. It is a gift from God, a benevolent father, for us to navigate through life, to walk through that minefield that we call life. And what do we see? We see the story of Joseph with his brothers. Jacob gives Joseph a coat of many colors to show him his love, and all that does is destroy the family. The brothers wind up at first trying to kill him, and then after that basically selling him to Egypt as a slave. That's the whole history of the Jewish nation. So parents have a, have a responsibility to not advertise if they do, not that they should, but many times we do, one sibling, one child over another. Sometimes a parent will identify with one child more than another. But the truth is, all children should be treated equally. And now some need more attention, especially if you have a child who is challenged. And that's more than acceptable. But when it comes to a normal family, whatever normal is, children should be treated equally. Now, the Torah tells us, um, let's deal with uh, the 10th commandment. The 10th commandment is actually written twice. The commandments are written twice in the Torah. First time, it states not to covet. It's the 10th commandment. Not to cover your neighbor's house. Not to cover your neighbor's wife. Using the word covet twice. His manservant, his maidservant, nor his ox or his donkey, nor anything that belongs to your neighbor. That's the first time it's written. Now the second time, it changes the order and says not to covet a man's wife, not to desire his house, and then it talks about, again, his field, his, his maidservant, manservant, and ox and donkey. All of, and all of those are desire are all possessions. So the key becomes is that when you, why does the Torah change the, this, this idea of first mentioning in the first part, the Torah it tells us not to covet a wife and possessions. In the second part, it talks about just coveting a wife and, then, and, and not desiring a house. And not only that, how can the Torah command us for an emotion? These are really emotions that we have. And one answer given is if you keep all the other nine commandments, you really won't have a desire for coveting. Uh, basically, you think of another man's wife or his property as belonging to a king. She's a princess. We don't have any thought that we're going to be married to the princess. We don't have any thought of owning the king's property. We know there's a separation. So therefore, if you follow the Torah properly, you know what's yours. God has given you yours. And that becomes the key. It's interesting that in Pirkei Avos, the question is asked, Ezu Asher, who's a rich man? And the answer given is, Sameach Bechelko, one who is happy with his lot. And that really becomes a great belief in God, to know that whatever God has given you is what you need. It's very specific. It's a, it's a, it's a prescription, if you will. 
you know, everybody thinks if only I had money, if I was wealthier, things would be good. It's been documented that 70% of lottery winners are broke within seven years. So you would think that that money would bring them happiness. Instead, it actually makes them worse. I remember having an accountant 30 years ago, 40 years ago by now, who went to Vegas at that time, won $20,000, which was a lot of money. A year later, he was out of, he was no longer in a profession, he was broke. Broken on skid row. He had lost everything, not just his money. So what we think many times, we're jealous of what people have. But the truth of the matter is, when we see what people have, um, it's not what it seems to be. There's a story told of a rich man who had a habit of inviting poor men, poor people to his table for a meal. And then after the meal, after he served this extravagant meal to them, he would let them take home dishes, silverware, things that were on the table as gifts. And he did this often. And one day he invited people and he had a whole table full of poor people. And the man sitting next to him was watching and he had a little bell. And he rang the bell and the servants came out, brought the first course. He rang the bell again, they cleaned it away. And then he rang the bell and they brought out the second course. And again he rang it again and they cleaned that. This went through for every course. At the end of the meal he went around the table and asked everybody what they wanted. Plates, the serving pieces, silverware, whatever. And when he came to the man who was right next to him, he said, what would you like? And the man said, I want the bell. And the rich man said, it's a small bell. It's really not worth much. Take the tea set. He said, no, no, no. I want the bell. And he said, it's really, he said, no, no. I want the bell. He said, okay. If you want the bell, take the bell. And he gave him the bell. And the poor man was very happy. And he went home and he told his friends, he said, I'm going to throw a party. And they said, you? And he said, yeah, I'm going to throw a party. Set, you know, set the tables. And they said, but they said, just set the tables. So they set the tables up and all of his friends came over. But they were sitting there, there was nothing in front of anybody, no food. And they looked at him, they said, you said it was a party, where's the food? He says, no problem. And he says, sits down, he's very happy and he chest out and picks up this little bell and he rings it. And nothing happens. He rings it a little bit louder and nothing happens. And he's taking the bell and he's shaking it and nothing's happening. And everybody's looking at him like he's crazy. He says, wait a second. He goes running to the man, rich man's house and he's banging on the door. And the rich man comes to the door and says, what's wrong? He says, give me the real bell. He said, I mean the real bell. He says, this is not the bell that you had. And the rich man looked at him and smiled very patiently. He said, you don't get it. He says, that is the bell that I rang. But behind that bell is all the years and all the effort and all the work that I put into my business. And when I ring that bell, that's what I ring. It's not the bell. It's all that I've done that makes it work. You haven't done that. That's why the bell doesn't work. Everyone wants my money, but do they really know what it takes to get there? I used to think that a person who inherited money was a nobody. But the truth of the matter is, even retaining wealth is an art form. Not just increasing it, just keeping it. And that becomes the key. And people are jealous. They're jealous of what the outcome is, but they're not jealous of the work that it takes to get there. And that becomes the key. A person has to understand, and having a belief in God helps you to put things in its proper perspective of what it is. What I'd like to do is, uh, again, next week, I think we'll continue a little bit more on this theme and finish off this idea of covet and of jealousies and of desire and bringing them all together and see how it is that we can handle these things to better cope with life and not accept it as this is who I am because it's not acceptable. It's the challenge of life. That's where we start and to make things even better. Thank you for coming. God bless and have a good Shabbos.